properly <clears throat> functioning, you, you're still a priest, you can still eat the bread of God, but functioning, function. And <clears throat> would anybody agree that function is important? As opposed to what, Randy? As opposed to a title? As opposed to having all your doctrinal ducks in order? or doctrinal docs, or however that goes, and <clears throat> in order, it is that we function. And, and I will tell you, in the New Testament, Jesus wants New Testament priests to be able to function. <clears throat> that function happens by life, which is Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, and it happens by... <clears throat> what you are. In the Old Testament, they would put priests in different places, you know, some would play instruments, some would sing, some would tend this, this thing, some would tend that one. <clears throat> in the New Testament, we are members of his body, and we function like organs, with whichever one we are. Uh, I was sharing this at a meeting that I shared at Tuesday night, <clears throat> that Jesus is the head, and we are members, but each, like each member of my body, or each priest in Jesus' priesthood, <clears throat> each member of his body, each member of my body doesn't have its own little brain, its own little mind. Each member draws from one mind, the mind of Christ. Amen? If you want to know why you're having trouble, it's because you've been going by your own mind. Tell me your mind doesn't give you trouble. <clears throat> so, um, however, built within each of the members is a function. A, a, a liver will function as a liver. A heart will function as a heart. A hand will function as a hand because that's, it's in its DNA. It's in its DNA. And so that's what it does. And that's what you do when you stop just trying to do stuff. Now, you can do anything by the nature of Christ. Amen. You, I mean, you can, you, can, you can give yourself. You can lay down your life. You can do that by Christ in any area. But it may not be your true function. You see what I mean? So it's always good to know exactly what works by life in you, <clears throat> not what has to be pumped up all the time. And that's where you see, you go to visit a lot of churches and stuff, and the pastor's main job is to keep his workers pumped up. You know, come on, yeah, let's, you know, has to come in with a new motivational speech. Well, <clears throat> you know, and I shouldn't be critical because I've got, you know, I fall back on my motivational speech all the time. You're dead. <laughs> Stop the motivation and let it be Christ's motivation. <clears throat> All right, so we've been studying these, and we sort of addressed, but we really didn't get into the scriptures of the last one. Was that man or devil? What was that? Was that a gunshot wound? <clears throat> we talked about a, um, a broken foot, broken hand, and, and then we just barely got into this thing of a crooked back. We took one angle of that, one angle, but I want to take another angle now of what that refers to. And again, in none of these are we identifying physical problems in you. You know. If Christ is your life, <clears throat> then he can live through you. It don't matter what. And, and what he's concerned with is your heart not the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. <clears throat> All right. So if you'll turn with me to Romans 15, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 1. And some of you may wonder why we're, if we're studying priesthood, why do we keep going to the New Testament scriptures? And the reason is we are studying what it means to be a New Testament priest. You'll only find the full meaning of that in the 
That's right, New Testament. Very good. We are sharp tonight. <clears throat> All right. Romans chapter 15 and verse 1 says, We then that are strong ought to bear. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna pick up something, if you're gonna bear something, if you're gonna carry a big old desk on your back, you better have a strong back. Right? Bearing <clears throat> refers to, and, and you'll, you'll see this, burden bearing is described like in the four Gospels we got into that is described by, by my, Matthew's Gospel which is pictured by the face of an oxen. And in the Middle East or anywhere you see oxen loaded down with stuff and bearing stuff. You see yokes on them and bearing and pulling stuff. <clears throat> and the requirement to bear is to have a strong back. Now we're talking a, a strong back spiritually. This says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. This is not talking about physical strength. This is talking about being a priest. And as a priest, you are able to bear things. Not just for yourself, but as this scripture says, to bear the infirmities of the weak. To be disqualified as a priest is one who can barely take care of their own life, much less worry about anybody else's. Wouldn't that make sense? I mean, you're going to be a priest, you're meant to serve God and people. You know, and so the strength here, the, the, strong, the, the not having a crooked back, the ability to bear here is, listen to what is described, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So it, it is exactly spelling out to you <clears throat> what it means to be a New Testament priest, what it means to have not a crooked back but a strong back, and that is specifically this, to bear the infirmities of the weak. Not just to bear ministry. Not just to be able to bear crisis or handle, you know, uh, new situations, change, you know. We say, oh, I can do all of that, but I cannot put up with these sissy, weak people that don't, you know, have it together in the Lord. I ju it just irks me, and I just, you know, and on and on and on. <clears throat> well, you know what that tells me? That you, you're not strong. You're, I mean, you, if you are a, high, a New Testament priest, you are meant to have everyone come to you with their problems. <laughs> I mean, think about it. That is what they do. You know, but what do we hear? We, and now, who, who are the priests? We all are the priests. See, now we go, well, I'm sure glad the pastor is, uh, you know, praise God, he can handle this because uh, I'd strangle those people. <laughs> you know. Y you are a priest. You're the one that should be able to bear their infirmities. You're the one they should come to. You say, but they're supposed to be priests too. Don't be pointing at them till you get it down. I mean, you know, I mean, when you got it down, then you can say, well, you lazy dog. But, you, you, but if you really have it down, you won't do that. You'll bear their infirmities. Isn't that funny how that works? <laughs> instead of condemning, instead of looking down on them, Instead of even, in a certain sense, considering them weak, I mean, I've often thought of this. <clears throat> I remember one time, a long time ago, someone came to me, and <clears throat> Jim wasn't with us at that time, and <clears throat> I was the, the pastor, and they came to me and said, uh, Pastor, I just need to talk to you. And so they came into the office and sat down, and they said, Man, you know, I'm just afraid to tell you, you know, what I'm going through, afraid you'll reject me. And I said, well, I'm not going to reject you. And they said, well, and they just could not seem to get it out for fear that they would reject. And a thought came to me. I thought, and I, I told this to him. I said, okay, so when you go to a doctor, and he's a doctor, and you go to him, you say, well, I'd really like to tell you what my problem is, but I'm afraid you'll reject me. But he's a doctor. He, you're supposed to come to him, and he's supposed to help you through it. Yeah. You know, so I, I was trying to get him to see that that's my, that's my place, is to hear those things and to, um, for lack of a better way, apply the remedy. 
help them. Be there for, you know, I mean, can you imagine going to a doctor and say, you know, my back is just killing me. And, and the doctor goes, well, you lazy dog, you're probably just lazy, you know. Or why do you come whining to me all the time? I mean, if, if you ever went to a doctor like that, you would find you another doctor. Well, some of you need to find you another pastor. Oh, wait a minute. This is all, oh, my God, I just chased everybody off. <clears throat> but, I mean, you know, you need to find you another priest. Now, maybe Jim never does that, and I've never, I, you know, I don't even know Jim can complain. I think when he was young, he had surgery, and it was removed. <clears throat> but Carolyn's going, oh, baby, <laughs> you don't even know. <laughs> Boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but but I'm not always available he's not so so some sometimes you go to the other priests in this place right and what do you get What do you get? Do you get somebody that goes, oh, I tell you what, man, that's what I'm here for. That's what we're here for. <clears throat> you know, you having an infirmity is not a problem. It's why the priesthood exists. That's what you tell them. You having that issue is not a problem. That's why we, the priesthood, exist. And uh, so we're here, you know. I'm, I, I want to help you through this instead of, you know, look down on like, well, don't you even know the cross yet? You know, or, you know, or, uh, uh, well, there, there. It'll all get better when you come to a revelation of Christ. Folks, these, <clears throat> these, these answers, even though they're true and they are God-given, we can make them just a little, uh, what? What's the word? A little saying, a little uh, cliche. <clears throat> instead of life. And we don't want to do that because then that makes us as guilty as any other group with any other teaching. You know? We, we must walk with the Lord every day. And we must walk in life with Him or we're going to reduce all the precious things we have down to little cliches and just little band-aids. You know? Just saying you need the cross doesn't really necessarily help somebody get to the cross. You know, just saying you need a revelation of Christ is not enough. I mean, if you can't do anything else, then, then take it, take the burden on you. Bear ye one another's burdens and pray for them. Stand in the gap. Make up the hedge. Do whatever you have to do. Pray that the Lord will give you a creative idea to help them or someone else. I know that God isn't going to show me the answers for everybody. I know that. So I regularly pray for the leadership here and for all the priests here. Because, because life flows through the whole body. I mean, the blood, life is in the blood and the blood's going to every part. Every part is feeding nourishment to all the other parts. Shooting through them to all the other parts. Tum, 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 tum. You feel it? The pace of life, tum, tum. Pumping away, pumping away pumping through us, moving through us, never stagnating in us, always moving through us to others. But in the same process, since we're in the, the flow, that blood cleanses, doesn't it, Carol? The blood cleanses. It takes away impurities and stuff like that it, it <clears throat> and moves right through us, brings oxygen, not just blood, but oxygen in the blood to keep us alive now how are we going to do that unless every member is vigilant to say this is the kind of body I want to be in you know I mean the truth is we can wander around and go visit a lot of churches and find a lot of problems <clears throat> if we find 15 things that they're doing wrong that we're not doing wrong there's probably 15 things we're doing wrong that they may actually be doing we have to stay in touch with the head. 
each one of us, each priest, moving together, moving by life. <clears throat> All right, so this is, you know, <clears throat> this is really showing something here because it's, it's, as a priest, you do bear the infirmities of all the others. That's not a, a light thing to you. That's not light. That, that's why you're there. It's not light. But that requires something on your part, too, and that is, you know, you, what you bear is you bear the infirmities of the weak. You don't have a crook back. You bear the infirmities of the weak and not. There's something you do. This is what you do. You bear and there's something you don't do, and not please ourselves. You say, well, if, if I don't take care of me, who will? <clears throat> well, you know, Carol just said the answer, everybody, but, but folks, that doesn't happen just automatically or by us wanting it to. It happens when we all start taking care of one another. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? I mean, the priesthood had to flow together as a priesthood. And they had rotations, and they had this and that, and they moved together. And <clears throat> but they all had a purpose, you know. <clears throat> and the purpose wasn't their individual calling. The purpose was the flow of the whole. And the whole, in this case, is the body of Christ. It really is. And, and, and we must be dedicated to that Jesus the Jesus of his body. I know most Christians are dedicated to the bearded one with sandals on the throne far away. I know that. And they go, I am committed to you. But are they committed to Jesus that's in them? I'm committed to let you live. I am not going to please myself. I'm going to let you please the Father. And are they committed to the Jesus of his body? You know, it's a huge thing. And it is a huge thing because it is what the priesthood is. It's what they're about. So, um, let's go over to 1 Corinthians and uh, chapter uh, 13. First Corinthians 13 and verse 7, it's talking about love, and it says, Love is kind, love is all this. Then it says, Love beareth all things. Beareth all things. No crook back here. You can, you can get up under the load for others. Galatians talks about this. He says, um, Bear ye one another's burdens. Isn't that interesting? Uh, it, it says, for every man shall bear his own burden. You go, well, how's that work? You know, I remember seeing a picture of, of what that looks like. Uh, and uh, not going to be a very good example, but, uh, you know, the arms going back here bearing this burden going forward but then you have another person here and they're bearing this person's burden but they got their own burden and they're carrying it and the person behind them is helped to bear their burden but they've got a burden and on and on and on you have someone with a burden and then someone with another burden but helping to bear their burden <clears throat> and on and on and on because it says both of those things. Every man shall bear his own burden, yes, but not by himself. Bear you one another's burdens. I remember a picture of hell once. Hell being a picture of all these people who are gathered around this table. And on the table is every kind of delicious food and, the, and every kind of dessert and wonderful thing to eat right there on that table <clears throat> and um, they uh, uh, but all the people around it were skinny because 
they were tied together, but the way they were tied together, you could not get food onto your fork and up to your mouth. It wouldn't reach. And so everyone was skinny, and they were trying so hard to get it, and it wouldn't reach, and they're frustrated. And then a picture of heaven was a table decked out in the same thing with all manner of food and delight, and all the people sitting around, they also were tied in the same manner. And they were not skinny. They were all fat and rosy and happy. Amen? And the reason was, was they would get the food and they would feed the person beside them. And they could reach them, but they couldn't reach themselves. You know? Well, we'd get up there, you know, as a, you know and go, well, I don't know how to do this. You know, because we haven't been doing it down here. You understand what I mean? We haven't been feeding each other taking care of each other, thinking in terms of that, you know. So the only difference between heaven and hell is selfishness, self-centeredness. The only difference between heaven to hell is in heaven, if you will, and we're just using that example, but those who are in Christ are new creatures. They are new. There's, meaning this, there's something new about them that is not after the old. If you were, if you didn't have much patience and couldn't put up with people before you met Jesus, now love suffers long and is kind. I mean, you know, because we go, okay, I've been suffering long. You know, I've been, I, I'm, I'm going to keep on suffering with you and you're just, you know, causing me to suffer and Suffer and suck and die. <laughs> you know, you know, and uh, just carrying on and all this kind of stuff. But it doesn't say love suffers long. It says love suffers long and is kind. I mean, you know, it's like we always read part of stuff. We read part of stuff and then we think that we're fulfilling, you know, oh, I'm doing, I'm telling, I'm keeping the word of God. I've been suffering long. You know, and we're all upset with the person we're suffering with or the couple of people we've been suffering with, you know. You know, I've been barren long, but love suffers long and is kind. I thought that was interesting how it tied those two together. And is kind. Envieth not. See, it doesn't say and love suffereth long and is kind. Envieth not. Envieth not. Oh, I know y'all got that down. That's, that's, not for, that's not for you here. I'm sure somebody on the video or listening to this, I'm sure that it's for nobody here. Nobody here would go, why don't I get that? Why, why do they always get this? I see these cave dwellers, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I have a weird... Thing. All right, let's move on because I'm, I'm starting to slip away here. <laughs> First Corinthians, still First Corinthians chapter 15 this time. And let's go to verse 49. Talking about not having a crooked back but a strong back to be able to bear for others. Bear. What? Isn't that interesting? He would give you a strong back to bear for others. But, you know, now, and that's, you know, now think about that. Because when we pray, if we, if we were thinking, well, I've got a crooked back, I want to be a priest. Lord, please heal me. Give me a strong back so that, you know, I can take care of my needs or whatever. You know, I mean, that's kind of the way we think. You know, Lord, heal me so I can, Lord, straighten me up. You know, crooked back. Straighten me up. So I'll be, you know, looked upon, you know, not as a crooked person, you know. But the true priest says, Lord, give me a strong back for others. Lord, heal me so that I can serve in the priesthood, serve your people, serve your body, serve others. Beloved. 
John said, let us love. I just think that's so funny. I, I've often thought of John, you know, he's the, the apostle of love. Beloved, let us love. You know, those who are loved, come on, love. <laughs> Beloved, love, please. Come on. You're loved. Wouldn't you just like to love someone else? Wouldn't, could I, please? No, never mind, that's uh, Adam Sandler. Could I just stay one night? <clears throat> Let the person love! Anyway, <clears throat> this says in verse 49, And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, that image is the image of Christ. It says that. The first man was the, after the earth earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. It's not after the heaven heavenly. It's not a heavenly man. It's Christ. That's what it says. And, and that may throw you. You know what? I, first time I heard that, I, I couldn't lay hold of that. And the second time I couldn't, it took me, I don't know what my problem was, but it took me a while to really catch what I just said. <laughs> but I wasn't the one who said it. My teacher in Bible school said that. But I heard it and I went, everything in me went, yeah, that's right. But for some reason when I'd read it, I still would see something other than the second man being the Lord himself and us his members. But that's what it said. Bear, you bore, you bore that image of the earthly. But I got news for you. This, I know this can be earth shaking. You've been born again. Isn't that good news? You've been born again. Yeah, you're not that same old earthly image. That same old cave dweller. You're not that, you know, thing. You're a creature, but you're a new creature. You're a new creature. And uh, Amber and I were talking about that because sometimes the earthly creatures have a hard time, you know, even putting up with a new creature. You know, I mean, it'd be, and I'm just using this as an example, and this doesn't make us better or worse. It's trying to show a contrast and why someone would have a hard time. If you were, if they were a, a caterpillar and you were a caterpillar and you're crawling along all your life, well, you know, then you feel pretty good, you know, crawling and talking and, you know, yeah, you're, you're one of the coolest caterpillars I ever met. Yeah, you're cool too, man, you know, and, you know, so you're down in the dirt and everything and you're not making much progress, but at least you're cool, you know, because you're a caterpillar and I'm, but one of them turns into a butterfly, and the first thing the other caterpillar says isn't, man, I would like to be like that. The first thing they say is, who do you think you are? <laughs> you know? You must think you're really something. You know? <laughs> Flitting around and seeming free, and trying to make me feel like I'm in bondage. Well, Jesus talked to, the, to, to Israel and uh, to the Jews, and they said, we're, we're not made of fornication. We're Abraham's seed. We're not in bondage to any man. And Jesus very sweetly said, you're of your father the devil. <laughs> I mean, he did. He did say that. He didn't say, now... Look, little caterpillar, no, 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 no. Not, don't let this influence your kid thing coming up. Look, little caterpillar, it's going to be all right. It's not going to be all right. You need a change, but the change isn't me. It's Jesus. And I'm not saying jump on people and tell them that. But I'm telling you, from their perspective, when they see, when they knew you as a caterpillar and now you're a butterfly... They don't like what they sense or see. They don't like it. You know, and you can understand. I mean, the, you know, those in the new creation envieth not. Those of the old probably do. So they're going to look and go, I don't, I don't like you anymore. You think you're just Miss 
sky high, you know, because you can climb, you know, with wings. No, I don't think I'm that. I think I'm one with Jesus, and I'm just glad to have found Jesus, you know. And with all the love in your heart, you try to communicate that, and they can't understand it because they're of another kind. All right. So this says, as, as is um, verse 49. Well, let's read 48 again, or first, and then go back to 49. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthy. Earthy, And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, notice this last little phrase, bear the image of the heavenly. It didn't say make you heavenly. It says you bear the image of the heavenly. Well, who is the heavenly? Well, verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord of, from heaven. He's the heavenly, and you bear his image. All right. <clears throat> what does that mean? What does it mean to bear his image? Well, I'll tell you what it means. We just read it two chapters in front of this one. Endureth all things. Not endure the things that you can endure and, and quit. You know, and, and, I, and again, now, I'm not being critical because I know you, I know me. We, if it's us, we will endure what we can endure, but what we can't, we're going we're gonna to drop that burden. Right? Or we'll endure it and not be kind. <laughs> you know, one way or the other, we're, we're still acting like an old creation. That 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter is the image we're supposed to be bearing. If you, wanna, if you really want proof of that, you've got to go back to the chapter just before 13. And I'll sum it up for you. You ready? This is going to be good. In chapter 12, it's all about the body and the function of the body, right? Do you, are you familiar with that? And it talks about some have this function and some have that and some are this and some are that, some are apostles, some are this, some are that. And it talks all about function. And then it talks about um, problems with envy and this. If the eye shall say, you know, if the hand shall say to the, you know, head, I'm not the eye or whatever, then are you not, you know, of the body and, you know, all this stuff going on. Now that's the body and it represents the body of Christ. Right? I mean, so, so it sounds like Paul is trying to talk to the body of Christ and go, look, you know, I know you wanted to be the eye, but you're the hand, and just find your place and function in that, right? I mean, isn't that more or less he's doing? And he's setting forth the fact that we're a body and that there are functions that we all fall in, and if we'll all take our place, then the body will run smoothly. Am I right or wrong? Yes. However, let me tell you, he ends that chapter after explaining all of that, which, which okay, before I go into that, what we do is we go make a little sheet of paper or two or three, and we pass it out to people and say, by filling this out, you're going to find out what your function is, and then the body's going to run together smoothly. Right? And, you know, of course, they've been doing that for at least 15 years. And I don't see anything more, any more smooth than was before. Why? Because Paul says, now, having explained that we're members of Christ and we're members one of another, and, and uh, as is the body, so is Christ, and we all have a function. Now, forget all of that because I want to show you a more excellent way. And basically, Paul is saying this. You know, if you had Jesus' nature functioning in you, then your function would be fine. And your getting along with other members would be fine. Because love suffers long and is kind, and love envieth not, and love vaunteth not itself. And all the stuff that the body's doing cannot be straightened out by straightening out the body, but by straightening out the body's life and all members drawn from one nature, one image, one person. His name is Jesus. It's the only way. 
That's Paul's explanation. Uh, have you never wondered why Paul is like shooting through there, you know, and he's talking about in chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11, that people are not getting along, having communion? You know, and, and there are, some are coming early and there are, some are eating and leaving other people out and all this stuff. So Paul tries to straighten that, straighten that deal out. Now, you know, we really should just get along. And, you know, so then he goes into chapter 12, which follows right on the heel. And then he starts talking about, let me explain this. You're not just a bunch of individuals showing up to a building. We are the body of Christ. We should flow and function as the body of Christ. And you have a flunk function in place, and we need to figure this all out. And then he says, but you know what? Let's get down to the more excellent way. I mean, doesn't it ever seem strange that if you ever read chapter 12 and then you read chapter 13, you go, where'd that come from? You know, I mean, if you don't know what he's saying, you just go, why does he jump subjects so much? Has anybody ever thought that? Boy, I have. I only saw two hands. I mean, I have just many times just gone, we were moving along pretty good here, and man, he just took off some. But most cases, he's not taken off into some other thing. We just don't understand because our little brain still is thinking, well, we just need to learn to function together and just be people that say we're the body of Christ and, and get, just get along. You're not going to get along. I mean, you will for a while. I mean, you will. You'll get along for a while, and then after a while, you'll, you know, you won't get along. <laughs> you know? And that leads to one of several things, you know, departure, death, or drugs. The big three Ds. Oh, yeah, I studied that in psychology. Actually, I just made it up, but anyway. <clears throat> All right. So he's talking. So he keeps that theme going, and he starts talking about resurrection in chapter 15. And the whole chapter 15 is dealing with resurrection. Anybody raised yet? Anybody raised up, made sit together in heavenly places in Christ? The only way you can get there is by oneness. It don't happen any other way. You can, claim, you can claim you're raised all you want, but if you're living after the image of the earthly, then that's what he's trying to describe here. Then why are you even claiming anything of the resurrection? Because to him, the resurrection is Christ now and forevermore. Christ, Christ. Always Jesus, always him. And always, always us finding our place with him, in him. Do you do that? Um, I know you do that theologically during class. It doesn't count until you get in the crisis. And then it keeps you, it saves you, that oneness with Jesus. It keeps you and saves you. It saves you from what? Your, your own reactions, your own attitudes. Paul said, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. If we just all had his nature, the body would be just fine. Right? All right. Just a little side note here. So if you ever wonder why I'm always preaching this stuff. Randy, why do you, you know, don't you know any other sermons? Why do you always preach the cross and resurrection? I mean, why are you always talking about the cross and resurrection? Why is that? That's all you ever preach. Okay, here's my answer. Once we get that down, I'm ready to move on. And so, you know, I, you know, it's not really me. I'm kind of waiting on you. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm suffering long, but I don't know how kind I am.
dream is what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. We've got a little while left, don't we? Oh, God bless you. <clears throat> All right, we're going to go ahead to number eight. The last one was seven, and there's 12 of them. And so eight is new beginning, dwarfism. I know you feel like you came up a little short, but... Dwarfism. What in the world is that? You know, I mean, I'm picturing a, a little priest, you know, <laughs> with a little, you know, yeah, a little mini Aaron, mini me Aaron, you know, <laughs> you know with a little ephod and a little. <clears throat> and, it, you know, I guess that's sort of a weird picture, isn't it? But, I mean, this says dwarfism in the Hebrew. And so I'm just seeing this little robe, you know, you know, that's what we look like to God, spiritually. Uh-huh, that's right. That's what we look like to God if we don't have this area down. Like some little mini-me in a little robe, you know, you know, yeah. And that's why you're always having trouble and you, you always can't reach what it is you're after in the Lord. Everything just seems to be a little out of your reach. You know? Anybody ever felt like that? Mike, what are you laughing at? My, I'm, I know what he's laughing at. He's sitting there thinking, depend, boss, depend. <laughs> Well, let's look at a scripture so that uh, maybe the Lord can move and get us. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Ephesians 4. And uh, starting with verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Notice unto the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, not many perfect men. And this is the definition of a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the goal. The measure of the, in other words, to come to full stature. Full stature is not personal maturity. Full stature is not personal maturity. Full stature is a body thing till we all come so that the fullness of Christ be brought in. What's the fullness of Christ? His body, his bride. Us, perfected after his image. Us, bearing his image to the people as priests. You can't get a more holy work. And yet, we, we have bad attitudes because people mess with our ministry. I mean, think about it. I mean, you know, well, I was wanting the ministry to go this way, and you're throwing a wrench in it. You know, your first ministry is to bear the image of him to the people. But we, you know, we'll fight for the ministry, and, and what is the first thing we'll surrender? The lamb. Forget the lamb, I'm offering him up, baby, but I want the ministry to be a certain way, my way, you know. So, dwarfism is when we have not come to full stature in Christ, in Christ, in union with Christ, in our understanding that we are not just doing this as Christians, we're doing this as branches, as that which is, as members of his body. I said that to say, to say it that way, to say, in other words, it's not individual attainment that he's after till we all come to one measure, to one stature, to one fullness, Christ. And what's true in, of him when it becomes true of us. No, not true of you. True of us. The purpose of the priest is to get the junk out so that we all can come. 
They don't sit in there and perfect themselves and then say, well, the heck with this. I'm tired of dwelling among these sinners. Let's build a monastery up on the hill. That way we're perfect. We don't have to mess with all these people that are not. No, sir. No, sir. They were camped around the tabernacle. They were the barrier between the people and the tabernacle. They were the thing right around it. And they were the ones who brought the people into the tabernacle, into the cross, the altar, into the laver, into the incense, into the light, into the presence of God. So, you know, that's the, that's the place, that's the thought, that's, you know. But instead... There has been a strong push in the, in the modern day church for people to remain as individuals and not growing up into this perfect man. We're seeking perfection apart from the man, the, the one who's perfect. You know, but we say that, you know, now we're seeking perfection on our own, but then when we mess up we say, well, nobody's perfect. Am I right or wrong? I mean, we, we're, we're seeking personal perfection, but when we mess up, we say nobody's perfect. No, there is somebody perfect. And then they go, yeah, Jesus, but he's the only one. Well, you're one with him. That was the whole point of resurrection. <laughs> it was the whole point, basically, was to make you one with him. So... There is a perfect man, and you're part of it. You say, well, am I, can I ever live to perfection? I don't know. I, I don't think you're supposed to live to perfection. You know, I think you're supposed to seek the Lord with all your heart. He must increase, and you must decrease. If Christ is living in you, it's perfect. Because <laughs> he's, he's the perfect one. If you're living in you, well, that's imperfect that was kind wasn't it it's imperfect because it's not him I wish I could say these words that could communicate this reality but it's just so difficult our focus has been upon ourselves and not the body but when I say the body, I'm not just talking about the people around here. Do you understand what I mean? I'm talking about the resurrected, in Christ, in union body that we are, that manifests down here. We have been living with a focus on, what do we say? Number one. You know, I'm looking out for number one. If everybody else goes to hell, that's their business, but I'm going to... You know, that's not a priest. <laughs> Do you see that? That's not a priest. And yet, many of the people who have that attitude are ministers. <laughs> we need, you need. Let, uh, let me just say it like this. I don't know how long I'm going to live, but some of you are pretty young in here. Somebody needs to keep saying it until somebody hears it. There is hope, Christ in you. There is hope. You can say, well, hardly anybody knows this. Well, then let's, let's tell them. You know? I mean, that, you know, we, we, go, we, we look around and say, well, hardly anybody knows this. You know, we're the only ones, which, which you know is a stupid statement. We're not the only ones. There are so many of God's people around that know him and love him and are going after him. And we're not the only ones, first of all. And second of all, we go, well, we're the only ones. And so we look at the mammoth task, and then we just flop down and go, it's too much, I can't do it, you know. Instead of going, well, then if, we're, you know, if we were the only ones, well, it would behoove us to go tell them. <laughs> We're not the only one, but I'm just saying, if we, you know, if we really believe that, then you'd go, well, then somebody needs to know. Well, somebody here 
needs to really, really hear what I'm talking about. No, no, no. Somebody here needs to hear the heart of the Lord concerning this matter. And take it to heart and say, and, and get it first to, to realize it is the truth of God, not of Randy. It is the truth of God. And then set your course to, to bless the body of Christ, to bring them in, to priest them. To priest them. Not in a superior manner, but in a serving, loving manner. By His Spirit. Bearing long, this sort of thing. Along these lines, there are so many things hard to understand because we have fixed our mind. We have ruts in our mind. Do you know that? We've driven those lane so often we have ruts and it's hard to get out of them we'll we'll hear something new and go and our spirit will bear witness and we'll know that's the lord and we'll go man that's the truth but our little vehicle will jump back in the rut later on and then pff, off we go down the road so that's one that's another reason why i keep paul or no it was i think peter was it said uh to say the same things to you is is not irksome but for you it is beneficial it is you know to say the same things i mean we need to we need to just think of it like this we need to hear it till we get it i mean that's our goal you know but when the dove lands on something and he'll land on something for one person and something for another person when the dove lands on it gather it up and count it precious Listen to him. Don't listen to me. He'll show you stuff I'm not even talking about. Listen to him and dump everything I have to say if the dove's landing on that. It's not about, it's not about the Bible school. It's not about this class. And it's not about me teaching you anything. It is about us all getting the Lord and going after him because the truth is we're going to have to do it together. And divine life has more, more is meant than just for the individual. Divine life, more was meant. There's this whole huge, incredible area that was meant for the body of Christ for us to have divine life. And that's the truth, you know. I think uh, as an individual, you will see a lot of results from, you know, living a crucified life. But in truth... The greater effect is not reached until a group has successfully got to a place where they can manifest his life, they can manifest it to one another consistently and do that under daily conditions. Divine life, crucified life. Think about it. And we say, well, okay, I am crucified, so we're willing to give up. Let's just, let's just take bad habits, okay? Let's say that you, were do, you had a bad habit that you were doing, and it was going to kill you if you kept doing it. So, you, so by the crucified life, by being crucified with Christ, and by the divine life of Christ, you actually got rid of those things. That's wonderful, isn't it? It's a benefit to the individual. But I'm telling you that in the heart of Jesus... He never meant to just go around and solve a bunch of individuals' life. This thing started with one man who represented the whole, and it ended with one man who represented the whole. And it's not finished. In God's eyes, I understand it's finished work. It's not finished until the manifestation has taken over and the manifestation of that isn't going to happen as long as we're thinking in terms of of an individual and you know success is when we live divine life toward one another under all conditions daily circumstances and i just i just believe that I, I wrote a statement here this lifestyle proves the true preeminence of christ above teaching or what we can see accomplished in us as individuals. Many of us can take a little notebook and write off the accomplishments that God's done within our lives since we've met him. And that's wonderful. And that's what we, that's what we want to stand before God for. 
But what if there was this whole other thought in his heart to gather the individuals into one? To gather us in one. And that in that one, his heart wasn't just going to have joy over what the cross and, and the resurrected life of, of Christ, the divine nature in us, accomplished for us individually and what we overcame, but rather what a group of people living together overcame. What? I mean, personally, I don't give much credence to any ministry or anything until that's, that happened. I don't, in this sense, if that's the end goal, we should not just sit down and say, well, we've done well, we're ahead of other people, if, if that be the, even be the case, if, if we be so blessed. But I, but I don't, see, here's my thinking. I don't see us as accomplishing anything above any other group if the cross isn't effective in how we can relate to one another. If the divine life can't overcome the worst problems that we have with one another. I mean, I'm just trying to be real. I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not trying to condemn, and I'm not, you know, coming at it from that angle. I just, I just think if we don't ever look at stuff real, then you can just walk around in a fairy tale land. If, you know, think about, think about this. You know, think about, think about the tragedy of Randy Nussbaum if he preached the cross, he preached that we're dead, and he preached that Christ is our life, and his big message was Christ is life, but he couldn't get along with certain people. I just, you know, couldn't forgive or whatever. And that was, he'd been preaching this for 20, 30 years, and he still had those same problems for 20, 30 years. I wouldn't listen to that man for one minute. He's a hypocrite. Do you agree? He's a hypocrite. Well, that may not apply to you. You may not be a hypocrite. You just may be still growing up in all things in him. But don't let that be an excuse. You know, the old saying, good, uh, you know, good is the worst enemy of better. So well, I'm doing good. Well, are you seeking on a higher plane, a better, a better? No, no, I'm doing good. I'll wait till I get in trouble. Then I'll seek for more, you know. Oh, man, keep the fires burning. Keep the engine stoked. Keep, the, keep it roaring on the inside of you. Keep loving Jesus. And, and keep, if you don't love one another, keep wanting to. I mean, I, I just believe that there's something to being able to look Jesus in the eye and say, you know what, I don't love so-and-so, but doggone it, I want to, and I know I'm supposed to by your nature, so come on now. No condemnation. I just love you, and I know the Lord loves you, and I know the Lord loves this place, but there are problems there are problems, and we must overcome by Christ, not just putting up with one another, but long-suffering and being kind. It's by Christ. What kind of glory will that give to the heart of Jesus when he sees us acting like him instead of ourselves? All right, well, we're just barely touching this here dwarfism thing. <laughs> But it's time to take a break. So we're going to take a break and come back in a minute.